Thank you, ladies, for such a beautiful song and preparing our hearts for the word. Heavenly Father, this is the place we have come to worship and adore you this morning. And Father, as we come to thy word, pray that our hearts would be open and receptive to what you have to say to us, Father. And I pray that we will leave different than when we came because of our worship before thee and because of the work of your Holy Spirit. Speak now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles now and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 13. We're going to start here, but we're going to move around, okay? So starting in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, one verse. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Solomon writes here, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now there's a lot in this one verse, but this morning I want to speak on what the scriptures have to say about hope deferred. Solomon says here, hope deferred makes the heart Six, sick. Deferred, as many of you know the meaning, it simply means delayed or postponed, you know, or uh, just put on hold. And perhaps this past year, there have been things you hoped for. Things you hoped would happen in your personal life or in someone else's life. And you prayed and you came to the Lord and asked him. And you brought these, these hopes to him. And nothing's happened. Nothing changed. And that hope has been put on hold. And you get, we get discouraged. And when hope is deferred or delayed, our hopes, our dreams, that is when, as Solomon says, it makes the heart sick. Maybe this morning that's where you are on this first day of the new year. You are feeling almost sick at heart because of the hope in your life that's been deferred, that's been delayed. And you wondered, Lord, why? Why have things not turned out the way I had prayed and hoped for? What do I hope for? Psalmist David wrote, in Psalm eleven three, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And he's talking about the foundations of this earth. What do we do when our foundations start to crumble? Maybe it was your economic situation this past year. Maybe it was sickness, the word cancer was given to you by the, doc the doctor, a loss of a loved one you had to bury, a problem in a home, a divorce, a dividing of families, and all this has happened and, you, and these foundations crumbled. What do we do then? Our hope seems to be deferred and dashed to pieces. But I want us to understand uh, something about biblical hope compared to worldly hope and the way we use the word hope today. You know, I hope this happens or I hope I can do this or I hope this turns out this way. The Greek word for hope is elpis, not Elvis, but elpis, E L. -I. P I S. And that has a meaning that is a little different than, I hope so. I hope this happens. No, this word speaks of anticipating something that is certain, expectation of what is sure to happen. A hope in that 
I know this is going to happen because God said it. I know this is going to come to pass because the word of God tells me it's going to come to pass. Whether that, and that concerns me, my life, not, not the, the earthly things that I have to deal with. Yes, there, there are no guarantees for today or tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed I'm going to live throughout this next year. There's no guarantees. But we find in Scripture, believer after believer, who lived by faith with this kind of hope. What made them go, keep going and going and going and not giving up was their hope in what God said. And I want us to take a look at one man this morning uh, who the, it's quite evident and speaks of this, this hope that he lived with that was on his mind and heart as he pushed forward in obedience to God. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. If you would, Genesis 12, go back to the story of Abraham here and God's promise to him. Verses one through four. Genesis 12, beginning of verse one. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There is a promise from God Almighty to this man, Abram. So what does Abraham do? He could have said, well, I hope that happens. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. It sounds so far-fetched. It's impossible. I'm getting too old for all this, you know. And, and he could have just said, said, no, thank you, Lord, but uh, I'll just continue to live my life in the comfort of my home, a comfort of my family where I am. No, what does he do? Verse four. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, 75 years old. How many of you had to move when you're 75 years old? Raise your hand. You just had to pick up everything and you decided I'm going to start over. No. It's crazy, isn't it? At that age? Why did he do that? Why did he get up and say to his family, let's go? Okay. His wife would say, okay, where are we going? And all his servants said, where, where are we going? Uh, I don't know. But we're going. And so, so he, he starts out. And God's going to lead him to this promised land this and this promise is God really going to fulfill such a promise Abraham believed it God repeated this promise to Abraham over and over and over again throughout the book of Genesis and then of course God later confirmed the promise that was to come when he gave them him and Sarah, their firstborn child, Isaac. And then, of course, after that, Jacob. But this was just the beginning of his, God's promise. This was the, uh, Abraham never experienced the fullness of God's promise, but he believed. He had hope that what God said was certainly going to happen in his life one day. That God said it, and if it's God's word, it is set in stone. Jesus said himself in John 17, your word is truth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So Abraham's 100 years old now. 100 years old, good as dead. 
You know, and Sarah is about 90 years old. And God gives them, uh, is going to give them a child. He gives them this child. And in their old age, here is evidence to him that God is beginning to keep his promise. But I want you to turn to Romans chapter 4 with me at this point. Let's go over to Romans 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul speaks concerning Abraham. Romans 4, pick it up at verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not in, uh, world was not through the law but through the righteousness of faith for if those who are of the law are heirs faith is made void and the promise is nulled he's talking about the, the jews here for the law brings about wrath but where there is no law, neither is there violation. In other words, God gave his law to the Israelites just to show their sinfulness, to reveal their sinfulness, and there's no way that they can walk a holy life and be acceptable before God. Verse 16, For this reason it is by faith that it might be in accordance with the grace, in order that the promise, there is the word promise, may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, and that's speaking of Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is what? The father of us all. What Paul is saying, he's saying, you Gentiles who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, did you know that you're descendants of Abraham? Did you know that this morning? You and I are descendants of Abraham, spiritually speaking. When we trusted Christ, because we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ with the same faith Abraham trusted God with all his promises. And that faith showed that you and I became, uh, became part of the seed of Abraham, spiritually speaking, and therefore we inherit future blessings that God has promised in his word. And then we go on, verse, uh, verse 17. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead. Abraham believed God would give life to the dead should he, he have to kill his son Isaac, which God had required of him. And calls into being that which does not exist. Verse 18. In hope against hope. In other words, what looked impossible in his life. He, what? Believed. Abraham believed in order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So your descendants, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith... He contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, verse 20, he did not what? He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what he, God, has promised, he is also able to perform. That is is hope the hope of the believer this is the way you and i are called to live out our life though hope is deferred we have not seen the promises fulfilled yet the promises you and i have received in christ we have we're going to have glorified bodies we're, we're going to be part of the new jerusalem a new city we're going to come with jesus christ and reign with him on the earth we shall reign with him as, as his bride. All these things, there's so many things that have yet to, to show the completion of our salvation. 
And yet, and I have to believe that these things are so and that they are certain. And so I can press on no matter what is happening in my life, no matter how bad it gets. My eyes are fixed on the promises of God and, and, and I'm holding to it just like Abraham did. And Abraham, he stayed firm in his faith. Now, it's so easy for all of us to waver and to, to get worried and scared. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 now with me, if you would. Hebrews 11. And we see that the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, and we'll pick it up at verse 8. The writer of Hebrews in this, we call it the hall of faith. He brings up Abraham's faith. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. See, there it is. He had no compass. He had no map. God was going to be his map. He was just going to trust God was going to lead him. Not knowing where he was going. By faith, verse 9, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Verse 10. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is who? God. That's what you and I are, are headed towards. That's what we are to focus our minds on. That was Abraham's hope. Not just an earthly city that would be built and his descendants would grow. No. Abraham was looking forward to the day of Christ. Somehow God had revealed to him uh, uh, the, the, what would happen in, in that day when Jesus would, would come and return and that, that he would actually be part of, uh, that Jesus Christ would come and, and restore Israel and everything, all the promises would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on here and he brings up Sarah, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised, who, considered who faithful? God. Therefore, also, there was born of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of the heavens in number and innumerable as the sands which are in the sea. All these died in faith. Well, that's not fun. They died in faith. They died believing the promise. Well, why didn't they receive the promise? Hope was deferred. Hope was delayed. But they had a certainty, even though God was delaying things, and it took God time, in God's time, they had a hope that these things will happen, it will be. And so because of that, verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, having what? Welcomed them from a distance. That's the real biblical hope right there. Having welcomed them from a distance. In other words, welcome. I know that it's coming. I know that it's, it's coming this year. When you, when we hit December, everybody was thinking, Christmas, Christmas is coming. And, you know, you see all these movies and films and things about, well, Christmas didn't show up or the Grinch tried to steal Christmas and all these things. But yet, the, yet Christmas still came, didn't it? We were sure that we were there, Christmas was coming because we'd seen it before and, and we knew that date was coming. But here they were, they were believing in things they had not seen yet. They died in faith, having welcomed them from a distance, the rest of verse 13, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. 
they are seeking a country of their own. And my friends, this is, this is hope. And Jesus Christ is our anchor of hope. Jesus Christ is the one who has given us the promises. He gave all those promises to us when he was in the upper room with his disciples. Those promises are for each one of us. I go and prepare a place for you, he said to them. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It didn't happen yet. Do you believe it? Do I really believe this book? Is this really the word of God? If I doubt this book, then I have the wrong kind of hope. Because I'm doubting the God of the universe who wrote this letter to me and to you. And if the promises are there for me, I have to live my life and ask the Lord, Lord, all right, I'm surrendering myself to your will. I don't know what 2023 is holding for me, but I know you hold that year. You hold the future and you hold me. And Lord, I am fixing my mind upon the things I know, the promises, the hope that you have given me, the certainty of things to come, and therefore I'm going to live by faith no matter what happens. I, I'm asking Lord, Lord, I, but do you know what? Do you know there's something that in, if, if, if I am going to live that way, there's something I have to do. And that is I have to completely surrender my will to God. There's no other way. If I hold back things or I'm holding on to things in this world and my own will and I want to do my own things I, and I kind of make my own plans and, and leave God out of the picture, then when, when, when the foundations start to crumble this next year, the health gets poor, lose a loved one, other things happen, suddenly I'm going to be shaken to the core because I haven't fully surrendered to the will of God. And by surrendering to the will of God, I'm surrendering to his promises. Therefore, I'm living by hope, certainty that what God says, I believe it. But I can only do that if I am fully surrendered to him. Fixing as the, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said in, ver, in chapter 12, and just flip over there, just slide over to Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight, and the sin which also easily besets us or entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here it is, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Writer says here, how do we run the race? Fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ. How do I fix my eyes on Jesus Christ? It's when I surrender my will to the Father. And I say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. How many know the name Elizabeth Elliot? Yes, you know Elizabeth. You know her story. You know, little did she know what would happen to her husband, Jim, as he was martyred by the Alka Indians. And you, many of you know the story. But here's um, a story that kind of has not been broadcast too much. Elizabeth Elliot's parents, who were missionaries in Belgium, moved back to the States when she was still a baby. And even though they were no longer on the mission field, Elizabeth's parents entertained dozens and dozens of missionaries, including a girl by the name of Betty Scott, who was heading to China to marry her fiance and fellow missionary, John Stamm. Betty, as she was called, possessed a gentle, warm disposition. She passionately loved the many facets, faceted aspects of life, and she loved poetry. She'd write poetry. 
Toward the close of her high school years, the girl succumbed to an attack of inflammatory rheumatism, which affected her heart to such an extent that for a matter of months, complete rest and quiet were necessary. She experienced affliction of sickness. During that period, Betty acquired awareness of the spiritual side of life deeper than she had previously known. Isn't that amazing how suffering will do that? It'll draw us closer to the Lord if we allow it to. Returning to the States for further education, she entered Wilson College, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, with a faith in God well-grounded. And the worldly, frivolous life of the world around her, which held charm for so many, had no attraction to her. Instead, she seriously and purposely devoted herself to her studies and graduated with honors. After one year at college, Betty had attended a summer conference, a Bible conference at Keswick, New Jersey. Anybody know Keswick, New Jersey? Some of you may have been there. Our family used to go there for years ministering. What well, was at that co- at Keswick that an altar call was given for Christians to surrender their lives completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what. And it was there that Betty surrendered to Christ in such a way that she couldn't believe it was possible. At the invitation to give her all to Christ, she went forward. And then after making that commitment that day, this is what she wrote in her Bible. And this was her commitment. Young people, listen to this. Where are you committed? How far are you committed to Jesus Christ today? You who are of age, older age, how committed are you and I to Christ and his will and to God's will and his plans? This is what she wrote, which was found in her Bible. Lord, I give up my own purposes and plans, all my own desires, hopes, and ambitions, whether they be fleshly or soulish, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee, to, uh, to be thine forever. I hand over to thy keeping all my friendships, all the people who I love, who are to take second place in my heart. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost, now and forever. To me to live is Christ. Amen. She wrote that. Those were her own words in her Bible. Later, in a letter to her parents, she added this. I don't know what God has in store for me. I'm, I'm, I really am willing to be an old maid, Christian, old maid missionary or an old maid anything else all my life if God wants that for me. It was as clear as day to me that the only worthwhile life is one of unconditional surrender to God's will and of living in his way trusting his love and guidance. And then a year later, after 12 months of college life, she wrote this. When we consecrate ourselves to God, we think we are making a great sacrifice, doing lots of things for him. When we really are only letting go some little trinkets, we have been grabbing And when our hands are empty, he fills them full of his treasures. You see, Betty found a fresh vision of surrender at Keswick Bible Conference that day. A year later, she and John, she met John at Moody Bible Institute. She and John got married for John Stam had the same vision and and had made the same surrender to the Lord for, for his will for his life, and they both had a heart for missions and both had a heart specifically for China. 
But after they were married, they went to China as missionaries. They were captured by Chinese communists. They were held for a, a large ransom and eventually marched to their execution by beheading. Betty at age 28 and John at age 27. Oh, they had gone to the mission field with a baby girl. She was not even a year old, but they managed to hide her before they were executed. And a few days later, a Chinese Christian found the baby and delivered her safely to Betty's family, who now lives. That sounds like a, a th life thrown away, right? What a way to throw away your life. End up being beheaded in some country for Jesus. What is that? What kind of surrender does it take to be willing to do, go there and say, whatever your will is, Lord. Now, most of us aren't going to have to go through something like that and be martyred for our faith. But we, you and I, can have the same surrendered heart that Betty and John had. Lord, whatever your will is, I want your plan for my life. And you show it to me. And that's basically it. Open hands, open heart. Lord, I give you all my plans and everything else this year. Would you make that commitment this, as we begin this new year, Christian? To make a full surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ of your life and your will. Watch what God will do with a surrendered heart in life. Let's, let's pray together. As we bow before the Lord this morning. Dear Christian. Perhaps the Lord is speaking to your heart and you realize you're not fully surrendered. Or maybe you surrendered a long time ago. But that commitment has waned. It's not what it once was. And now your life is full of all kinds of things. But you're not living totally, completely, unashamedly for Christ. And God's will in your life. Would you be willing today to make that commitment that Betty made that many years ago? And say, Lord, I give up all my plans. Would you do this now, Christian? Just say it to the Lord. Lord, I give up all my plans, my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and I accept thy will for my life. Would you do that right now, Christian? Do it now. If you're here without Christ, I invite you to accept the Savior. Open your heart and receive him by faith. If you've never done that, you don't know the Savior, you've never known forgiveness of your sin, would you pray with me now and give your heart to Christ? Pray a simple prayer like this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. I believe you died on that cross for me and took the punishment for my sin. Come into my heart right now. Wash my sins away. I receive you today as my very own Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead, Lord Jesus. And with head still bowed, if you gave your heart to Christ this day, you are now a child of God, born again. Welcome to the family. Heavenly Father, thank you for decisions made, Lord. I pray we would leave here starting this new year with a fully surrendered heart. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.